The end of the Victorian period from around 1890 starts to see a sudden and dramatic shift in the cultural attitudes towards physical activity, particularly for women. Departing from earlier idealizations of delicacy and a swooning, consumptive frailness in the female appearance, wherein physical exertion is thought to be detrimental to a woman's health, the late 19th century starts to see an acknowledgement in the importance of exercise and physical strength. Written accounts begin to reference frequently what have become popular sports, tennis, golf, swimming, cycling, and begin to advertise items of clothing to help facilitate the greater range of movements required by these new activities. One such garment is the split skirt, or as we say in the Rachel Maxey cinematic universe, secret pants. Bifurcated garments for women by this time were still, if not always contentious, at least highly uncommon in public dress, despite attempts by some American women 40 years previously to popularize what became known as bloomers. But it was becoming quickly acknowledged that cycling, now increasingly popular and socially acceptable for women, could not easily or safely be done in skirts. And so while we do see the popularization of cycling breeches, fully bifurcated garments that resemble the earlier bloomers, vaguely, the very obvious sporting appearance of these is great for a dedicated ride, but to put it in a modern perspective may have been a bit like cycling to the office in bicycle shorts and then having to give a very important presentation still in said bicycle shorts. This is where the split skirt comes in, a garment that in all appearance, when fully buttoned up, is a socially acceptable skirt, but which can be unbuttoned to reveal the split which facilitates the ability to cycle home safely. So this is the pattern that initially inspired this project. This is the split skirt pattern from Truly Victorian. A viewer of this channel called Parker, who I have been in communication with since like the dawn of my channel, got in touch and sent me a bunch of extant Victorian split skirt patterns, as well as a bunch of extant Victorian split skirts. And so he was showing me a bunch of those and the different ways that they all configure. They're all so different because this is a new garment. There is no standard. Some of them, as this pattern does, close at the center front with a series of buttons. This is the bit that goes in between the legs. This is the actual center front of the skirt right here. And then this is the back of the skirt that connects to that here and that forms the leg. I also saw a bunch of examples where the buttons were on either side. So here at the side front seam, as well as on the other side of the side front seam, there's a panel across the front and there are buttons down both sides. On one side, they're kind of false. And basically that other side of the panel unbuttons, folds over and buttons onto this side so that you have the pants, but otherwise you can button it over that way and conceal the split. And I just thought that was so ingenious. I love the little folding configuration. This one, basically you unbutton it to have the legs. Um, that's also a very common option for split skirts, but the other one, the double button panel thing just appeals to me a little bit more. So what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to use this pattern as a reference, but go for the other design. So what I will have to do, I've just been looking at this pattern and then looking through their instructions to see how they put it together, trying to come up with a battle plan as to how I am going to do this. The decision that I have come to is I'm going to draft that front piece. And that front piece is basically just going to involve tracing from here down to, I'm cutting the bicycle length, not the full length, down to there, as well as up just the center front line, just there, not going all the way back. I have all this knowledge in theory in my brain, but I haven't yet put it into practice. So I'm sure there will be many trials and tribulations of this entire process whilst we actually get to sewing the thing. Okay, so this piece is drafted. I've been playing around with the bits on paper just to try and get my head around the geometry and the folding of this. I was having some doubts, so I ended up cutting out some small shapes just so that I could play with them and experiment with them. But I think I figured it out. Here is how it works. So I've got these two shapes here. These are the leg shapes that get stitched together at this seam to form the legs. But then what happens is because on the original, you can't just put the front panel on like this and button it down both sides and then unbutton the side and fold it over because then you have this massive like double fold on the second leg, which doesn't make it look the most like pants. What you do is this swing panel is actually attached on this side right here so that when this is being worn as a skirt, it is effectively sitting like this with all of these layers on this side, this swing panel covering all of it and then buttoning onto the other side of the 
skirt. When it opens up at the pants, this side unbuttons. These buttons over here on this side are false from about the hip down where it doesn't have to unbutton at the top to get the skirt on and off. This bit unbuttons and just this first layer folds back and then this sits folded, oh my God. This sits folded back behind here so that all you are left with is the pants. And then when you want to re-skirt yourself to mingle amongst polite society, you just unbutton this side, flip it over, button it back, and you're back to a skirt. The only thing left to do now is to get this cut out of actual fabric and see how it starts working, which is the part that makes me a little bit nervous. I've decided to make this skirt out of the glorious brown tweed that I picked up in the New York City garment district on one of my shopping adventures. It's very drapey and lightweight, which I thought would make a nice movable pair of adventure trousers. In hindsight, I do wish I'd interlined them with something though. They are definitely fine on their own, but I just know the actual Victorians would have preferred something with a little bit more structure, and so therefore, so would I. I probably should have interlined them with tarlatan, nothing too heavy so that they maintain their light drapiness, but still have that hint of body and stiffness to them. Got my pieces cut out. I have now begun the process of marking the chalk lines onto my pieces. There are pleats, there are darts, obviously many, many buttonholes. But the thing about a lot of commercial patterns, truly Victorian included, is that they include the seam allowance. So within the whole shape of the pattern is built in half an inch or five eighths of an inch or whatever they say on the instructions of seam allowance, which usually is quite convenient when you are using a modern sewing machine because on the foot of the sewing machine they've got little measuring gauges to say match up the edge to this line to achieve a half inch seam or whatever have you. That is not a thing on ye old Victorian machines. I'm kind of on my own with figuring out the seam allowance. This just requires an extra step for me in now measuring in the seam allowance so that I can give myself a stitching line where I'm supposed to actually stitch because I won't be able to measure in with the foot itself. This is partly why I prefer to work with net patterns or patterns that do not have the seam allowance included. They're just the net shape of the actual garment piece. So I'm marking these all with chalk just because it's nice and quick. However, the thing about chalk, especially on loose fiber materials such as wool, is that it does dust off after a bit. I do intend to get this um, split skirt put together fairly quickly. However, I don't want to take a chance of the lines rubbing away, so I will then be going over all of these chalk marks with thread marking, which is basically just very loose running stitches. Thread marking is also very useful in being able to see your marked lines on both sides of the material. In many cases, Victorian and Edwardian garments are just left raw at the seams because ain't nobody got time for finishing seams apparently. I'm not sure that I want to do that on this firstly because I have every intention of wearing this all the time and I want it to be as sturdy as possible, but also because because this wool is a little bit prone to fraying, I think it will be better to just finish off the seams. This might be a lightweight enough wool that I could get away with French seaming it. That is all to say that thread marking is pretty necessary for French seaming because you need to be able to see your lines from both sides because there's a lot of flipping in and out, but anyway. The original pattern involves pleats at the back, so I'm just pressing and basting those into place. I did end up taking out this basting and ignoring these pre-pressed pleat paths in the end though, since my new configuration required different pleating configurations in the front, which affected how much room I had in the back. But nevertheless, these pleats were really satisfying to put in, so here is this footage anyway. <laughs> We have all of our pieces cut out, thread marked, and pleated where necessary. So we are ready to go ahead and start stitching. The one thing that I'm going to have to think about before I start putting seams together though is pockets. I don't believe that the split skirts that I looked at, the extant ones, had pockets. I will not abide by this no pocket business and neither will Bertha Banner. So putting pockets into anything that you could put a pocket into is historically accurate to this period. I'm as yet undetermined as to where that pocket is going to go. This is a little bit deceiving because this and this are actually the front panel. This is the swing panel that goes that. So basically all of this is that one thing. 
This is the side front seam that wraps around mostly to the back. And then that's a side back seam. And then that's the center back seam. If I put a pocket into that seam, it will be a little bit far back, which won't be the worst. You know, you can just reach a little bit further back and pull something out of your pocket. It's not the safest positioning for a pocket, especially for us as <laughs> city dwellers. So I would prefer not to have a pocket set towards the back of a garment. The other option would be either this is going to be a fall front. So there would kind of have to be a sneaky pocket like in the fall front somehow. The other option is just to cut one of these darts and extend it a little bit, make it a full actual seam and set a pocket in there. I'm not sure if I want to do that either. We will see. I did decide to French seam these seams and in order to get the stripes to match up perfectly all along the seam, since this fabric is a little bit wobbly, I am first basting each folded seam before the final row of stitching is put into place. After stitching the main seams together, I am next taking a brief interlude to cut out some extremity pieces, waistband, two sets of plackets, and of course, two sets of pockets. Then I'm just making up those pockets in the Victorian manner as described in Bertha Banner's Household Sewing with Home Dressmaking, and which I have explained in greater detail in previous skirt making projects. I'm also making up these two plackets, each with a layer of tarlatan in between to stiffen them a little bit since these will need to be strong enough to support buttons. So for these two side front seams, I'm doing things a little bit differently. The French seams on these are going in the opposite direction so that the flange will end up on the outside of the garment as opposed to the inside of the garment like all of the other French seams. On the original split skirt, these seams are top stitched down from the outside to form what looks like an overlaying panel. That way, whatever side the swing panel is not buttoned to will still match the swing panel edge, which will itself be top stitched all along that edge, if that makes any sense. Okay, I'm going to endeavor to explain because I don't feel like that was the most immediately obvious thing to see. All of my seams generally are French seams, which means that the seams are sewn initially with the raw edges facing to the outside and then sewn again on the inside so that this little flange thing is all nice and finished but on the inside of the garment except the seams i haven't pressed this by the way the seams on either side of the side front panel instead of sewing the second half of the french seam just straight like that i stitched it so that it sits on top of the fabric and this flange is facing this way. The reason for that being is because this is supposed to mimic the top stitching on this edge. This is the swing panel. So this will either swing this way and button when it is in skirt mode. And therefore on this side, you have this other seam here, which is false. As you can see, this is not buttoned to anything, but there will be false buttons so that it looks like this one panel has been buttoned onto the front of the skirt. And it's just a decorative buttoned panel that is supposed to be there. But in reality, this seam is actually fake. Whereas when you swing this swing panel over to this side and you are wearing the trousers, as you can see, the top stitching of the swing panel is now on this side. This gets buttoned. So you have another faked panel on this side where this top stitching is once again, this seam is fake. It is just top stitched down onto this side of this panel. But as you can see, this is not 
a panel, but it will be made to look like the front panel of the trousers button on decoratively on both sides. This is a very clever thing that is done on the extant split skirts. The pattern doesn't tell you to do this, but this was just such a clever thing that you can see evidence of in the extant examples that I definitely wanted to try and recreate for my endeavor at a split skirt. So what I've decided to do about the pockets is to put them in behind the plackets, because on either side of the fall front opening, there will need to be plackets to host the buttons. And this also means that there will need to be a seam between the placket and the actual skirt, inside which we can slip our pockets. This was actually done frequently in skirts in the late 19th century. Pockets were often inserted into this placket seam, often though this was in the center back of a skirt, which is a little awkward to reach, but I see no reason why we can't adopt the same philosophy for our fall front plackets. To do this, I'm first stitching one side of my pocket to the side front skirt edge. Then I can stitch the placket to the other side of the pocket edge. Okay, so here's where we are so far. You probably cannot understand what's going on because this garment is heckin' confusing. I have got the plackets and the pockets in, so the buttons will go onto the placket here. There will be buttonholes in this side here. This is this front fall front panel thing that will button to the placket, however, you can still reach the pocket because between the placket and the skirt is the opening to the pocket. As you can see, I backstitched the placket on. This edge was then turned and felled under to hide this raw edge, but as you can see, because it is a pocket, this raw edge here would have been raw had I not just added a little bit of tape over that edge. I'm putting a little bit more seam finishing into this garment than the typical Victorian dressmaker probably would have done. A lot of late 19th century garments, a lot of just historical garments in general, have tons and tons and tons of unfinished edges because if no one's gonna see it and your fabric is stable enough, why does it matter? This fabric, however, is very, very prone to fraying, as you can see, so I'm endeavoring to finish every edge that I possibly can. This edge here, I have yet to finish. I've got this inch twill tape that I'm just going to put along this edge here just to finish that edge. I'll stitch it down on this side, but not on this side because I have to put buttonholes in this side so that this side can button to the side. Um, and this fabric is a little bit too wudgy and weak to withstand a buttonhole all on its own. So I do want this backing on the underside of this just to give that a little bit more strength. That will also give me a nice excuse to finish this edge all nicely. I won't have to stitch it down on the other side though. Firstly, because this is only one layer and a second row of felling over here will show on the center front of the garment, which I don't really want. However, that doesn't really matter because as I stitch the buttonholes horizontally, this bit of tape will just get nice and anchored down periodically. So you'll see when I actually get that done. I'm not going to do that quite yet. What I'm going to do right now is actually try this on and just make sure, well, I know the waist doesn't fit. I'll probably have to put a couple more pleats in the back of it, get that all nice and fitted, probably get the waistband stitched on because I, I actually have to go pick up Cesario from the hospital. He's having some bladder stones removed. Poor little piggy. But I have a nice long two hours return journey to make this afternoon to fetch him, so I want to leave some of the hand sewing to do until then. So this morning I'm just going to focus on getting the waistband on. The waistband does not go across this front bit. This will just get a little bit of binding and then will hook onto the front. I apologize if this sounds way more confusing both in my description as well as in what I'm trying to show you, but this garment is confusing and it's confusing me as well, don't worry. Um, I am failing to document this because this project has been going on for weeks now, but it has become a running theme where every seam I sew in, I sew in incorrectly because not only have I got all this origami nonsense happening, but I'm also French seaming it and not French seaming it all in the same direction. Like some French seams have the flange on the inside and some French seams have the flange on the outside. I've ripped out both of these seams on either side for two different reasons. <laughs> this project, I'm fairly convinced, is basically just cursed. Anyway, if you are for some reason endeavoring to follow this video to follow this at home, good luck. The pattern itself, if you actually follow the truly Victorian pattern, is probably extremely nice and straightforward and just a wonderful project to do. But if you are trying to completely bastardize the original pattern to make it like a garment that was made a hundred years ago, it's a little bit of a different story, so we're giving this a go. The waistband gets stitched onto the waist edge of the skirt all around, except for the full front edge. However, the waistband does extend for about three inches past the side front edge to be free floating. These will hook together separately to provide a secure hold before the full front can be buttoned into place. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
we are beginning to have something that somewhat almost is starting to look like a split skirt this is very exciting news so we have our waistband we have our plackets we have our secret pockets still have to put some hooks on here so that this can hook shut i'm going to have to try that on and figure out precisely where those hooks need to go i also i have finished these little tapes down here these are as planned just fell down onto this side this side is just left free i just sort of pinned this down for now but what i do have to do before i get started with putting on the binding on the top edge of here is i have to continue the top stitching as you can see my top stitching stopped right here and then it doesn't continue up here in order to make this look like it's part of this I need to continue my line of top stitching just up that way. Then we will get to starting the binding with those press the top to spin panel. I just do not, it has taken me a solid day to work out how the closure on the top bit of this, not the closure, the binding bit. I did consult the X and split skirt. That of course gave me most of the answers. What it looks like is happening is this swing bit here has just been folded down and top stitched just a little bit shorter than th that so that when this lays across and fastens it sits just underneath the binding like that and it will just hook over there this second bit back here just gets bound off straight across so what i'm about to go do now is run this under the machine and just put a little bit of top stitching in just here. And then I will probably handle the binding on the top edge of this by hand because this just seems like a tricky junction to get across and I don't trust the machine to do that. In an effort to stave off my usual hatred of sewing on hook and eye closures, Nikki Liam has actually very kindly run some skirt hook drills with me and somehow miraculously made me hate them a little bit less. Just in time to tackle the waistband hook and eye, the hook and bars on either side of the fall front waist edge, and for the rest of the closures to consist of approximately 40,000 buttons and buttonholes instead. So naturally, I did what any sensible seamster would do when finding oneself in a situation facing a frankly unreasonable amount of buttonholes, I procrastinated doing them until they were the very last task left to do, and the only task left before that is to hem the bottom edges. And thus, the split skirt is complete. This was, without a doubt, the most challenging project I think I have ever taken on. Not in the physical sewing sense, since it's really just a bunch of straightforward seams, but the wild geometry and all the folding parts certainly made for a brain twister on this one. But I'm glad I managed to make this functional in the end.
I am most pleased to report that I have definitely got on board the Secret Pants hype train because these things are stealthy and they are great. I've paired them with this reproduction of a circa 1900 cycling jumper, very kindly borrowed from my friend Constance. The boots are Joe Bear's reproduction Victorian work boots, hat is from Lock & Co, and the satchel is the new Florence, a very kind loan from my friends over at Bera Bera, with whom schemes are currently being schemed. Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed this little venture, and I wish you good fortune on your onward journey. This video requires an extra special thanks to Audible, not only for sponsoring, but also for providing the hours of listening entertainment, and thus sanity, required for the three days spent buttonholing and buttoning. I managed at long last to tick Donna Tartt's The Secret History off my dark academia aesthetic trash bucket list, and oh my goodness if that wasn't the perfect immersive autumnal experience to transport me away from this tedious and repetitive task, and to make the time fly by. I'd been meaning to read it for a while, but it's such a long book I just kept putting it off, but long audiobooks are the absolute perfect companion to long hand sewing projects. Audible members receive a new credit each month to put towards the listening piece of your choosing. In addition to their extensive audiobook collection, the Audible Plus catalog offers an even more extensive range of listening material, including Audible originals, podcasts, guided fitness and meditation sessions, sleep tracks, and more. To sign up for your 30-day free trial, visit audible.com Bernadette or text Bernadette to 500 500.